Um, this morning, uh, we get the last of a series of seven ser sermons on heart attitudes. And uh, this one, I think, for a pastor, is probably one of the harder ones to preach because it talks about a pastor. And it's always hard to talk about your position, right? What you're doing and, and how people fall. When we look at a leader, um, the world defines a leader as, as the person who leads or commands a group is a leader. So we think of guys like Steve Jobs, who was a great leader in the technology world, right? Or we think of historical guys like Churchill, who led a nation to be able to up against a foe that was could have taken a look like they were going to win. Or we might look at further back and we look at uh, other leaders like Alexander the Great or, or many other ones like that. And, and those are the leaders that the world looks to to define leadership. When we look at the Bible and we look at the spiritual leader of a church, the Bible defines a leader much more thoroughly than I think the world does. Or at least gives the qualifications of what a leader should be much more so than the world does. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 13, we're going to get some, some background for us this morning, and uh, I'm going to be reading this morning from the message, and in this passage of scripture, it's not really what our text is, we're going to get to our text, our text you can see in the little leaf that we hand out this morning in Hebrews, but uh, this morning I thought it would be important for us to look at how scripture defines a leader, and we read there, it says, if anyone wants to provide leadership in the church, good. But there are preconditions. A leader must be well thought of, committed to his wife, cool and collected, accessible and hospi hospitable. He must know what he is talking about, not, not the over fond of wine, not pushy but gentle, not thin skinned, not money hungry. He must handle his own affairs well, attentive to his own children and having their respect. For if someone is unable to handle his own affairs, how can he take care of God's church? So, he must not be a new believer, lest the position go to his head and the devil trip him up. Outsiders must think well of him, or else the devil will figure out a way to lure him into his trap. It goes on and says, the same goes for those who want to be servants in the church. Serious, not to set the seat full, not too free with the bottle. Not in for, for for what he gets for what they get out of it. They must be reverent before the mysteries of the faith, not using their position to try to run things. Let them prove themselves first. If they show they can do it, take them on. No exceptions are, are to be made for women. Same same qualifications: serious, dependable, not sharp tongue, not over fond of wine. Servants in the church are to be committed to their spouses, attentive to their own children, and diligent in looking after their own affairs. Those who do this servant work will become highly respected, a real credit to this Jesus faith. You see, that is the definition of what uh, of leaders of our church are. Not only the pastors of the church necessarily, but also the servants of the church. It's interesting we call our, our leaders in our church servant leaders, isn't it? This passage of scripture qualifies that quite well. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's something that shouldn't be taken lightly. It's something that, that uh, when we put a person in there, it should, in a position, it should be a person that we can respect and a person that we can follow. These men and women that we look to for leadership deserve our attention if we want our church to grow and to move forward. They need to know that we are willing to follow because of the call God has placed on their lives. Too often, though, when we call a man to be our pastor, we think of him as an employee of the church, which is in the world's way of looking at things. A person called to the church, a pastor called to the church, they're not an employee of the church. They are men called and women called by God to lead the church He has called them to. This is why it's important that the church that calls a pastor must seek God and determine if this man or woman is, is the one God has called to their church. The calling of a pastor is not a hiring of an employee. It's a recognition of the call of God, of a servant of God. 
So as, you know, in our situation here in our church, as we're beginning to look towards that calling of a new pastor to replace me, it's not that we're looking to hire a new person. We're looking to find a man that God, or a woman that God has called to be the pastor of this congregation. When we start thinking of them as employee, our perspective of who they are and their task we get really off track. And that's the same whether we're looking to our, our lead pastor, Pastor A, or Felix, our uh, Cantonese pastor, or Shutran, our pastor of the Mandarin congregation. As we look to them as our leaders of our church, we need to understand what the, how, how it is that God has called them to be in this position. So when we look this morning at the final heart attitude, it's important to have a clear understanding of who and what a leader is in the context of the church. It's different than the leader that we follow in the workplace or on a sports team. Heart attitude number seven is follow spiritual leadership within spiritual limits and make it joyful. This would be one of the biggest responsibilities that we all have in following our leadership. Being responsive to your pastor, pastoral, pastoral leadership is so important. Listening to their counsel. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, this is how that's what it begins by telling us. It said, goes on and says, They are alert to the condition of your lives and under and the work under the strict supervision of God. Contribute to their joy of their leadership, not to drudgery. Why would they want to make why would we want to, why would you want to make things harder for them? In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 and 7, we read this. It says, And you who are younger, follow your follow your leaders. But all of you leaders and followers alike are to be down to earth with each other. For God has it has had it with the proud, but takes delight in just plain people. So be content with who you are, and don't put on airs. God's strong hand is on you. He'll pro promote you at the right time. Live carefree before God. He is most careful with you. So be, be who we are. Be real to one another. Be transparent. Have integrity. That's what it is to, to be leaders and following leaders. It is to follow a leader, I, I should say. Often, too often, I think we get so, so struck, wrapped up in what, who's doing what, what my agenda is, and all those kinds of things. It is clear in this passage of Scripture that we just need to be who we are, and not worry about what we're going to get. What does it mean to follow a spiritual leader within spiritual limits? Well, it's not following blindly, for starters. We must not just follow because of what the pastor's has said, we must be sure that we are not being led away from the truth. When some have followed blindly, it has led to destruction. Historically, we've seen this been repeated often. We can't just follow blindly. When you think of situations like uh, down in Texas with that Davidic, I guess, cult, right call, what happened when they followed blindly? Well, led them to their deaths. Or we might think of, of the Jim Jones situation where they followed the pastor blindly. What did they do? They all drank poison and died together. Or we might look to another situation. Remember when the when the, the comet came over? I can't remember what exactly it was called. Yeah. And uh, what did they do? That one cult that followed this leader blindly? suicide together. David Craig. It's terrible, isn't it? When we think about these things. So to follow within spiritual limits means that we must lead, well, the leader must lead according to the Word of God. And also, it's not going to the world for guidance. The world has many ideas what, what leadership is, but they are not the authority for us. We must seek the Word and trust that God's Word is the final authority. We can let standards of the world determine what we can't let the standards of the world determine what we do as a church. 
There are times that we will find that the spiritual leaders will, will lead in the opposite direction that the world is going. And when this is the, when this is in the context of the word, that is within spiritual limits. That's what it means to follow within spiritual limits. We must, must not let the world determine what is good and right for the church to do. Too often today we look to say, what does a seeker want, want from church and what, what the world would want from church? We can't do that. We must go in the direction that God would have us go. What the Word of God would direct us to go. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 through 3, we read this. It says, I have a special concern for you church leaders. I know what it's like to be a leader in, in, on, on Christ's suffering as well as the, as the coming glory. Here's my concern, that you care for, the, for God's flock with all diligence of the shepherd. Not because you have to, but because you want to please God. Not calculating what you, get, what you can get out of it, but, but acting spontaneously. Not bossily telling others what to do, but tenderly showing them the way. Different section of scripture, right? But it tells us what spiritual limits are. To follow leaders within spiritual limits doesn't mean that, that the, your pastor or, the, or servant leaders come before you and say, this is what you're going to do, this is how you're going to do it. It's, going, it's more of a loving and caring relationship between each other. It's walking with you rather than pushing you. In Romans chapter 12, verse 8, it says this. It says, if you give encouragement and guidance, be careful that you do not get lost." If you're put in charge, don't, be, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself be irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. Both passages directly speak to what it means to have spiritual limits. It's not being bossy or pushy. It's, it's, going, it's going beyond what the world, world leaders would do. It's leading to, to a God-centered way of life. A God-centered way of living. This is a different way of doing leadership, isn't it? As it, come, it comes from caring rather than bossing in the bossing direction. It comes from a Jesus example rather than a Donald Trump example. It comes from an angle of not what I get out of it, but what I put into it. This is a different kind of leadership. It comes from a different kind of perspective. That perspective comes from an understanding that it is God who is called the leader, and that the church is not a hired gun. He's not a hired gun in the, in, for leadership. When we get to the, get to this way of understanding the leader, God has called. We'll have the right perspective on how we approach the leadership God has called to our church. We can then come together with the, with the leadership and begin to understand the direction God is leading the church. They are, they, are, they are there to help lead the church and the individual towards the path that God would have them be on and the work of God. But now there is one little other part of that little hard attitude. So it says, follow spiritual leadership within spiritual limits. And then there's one little tag on the end of it. It says, Make it a joy for them. Pastoring, or being a pastor, is one of the toughest jobs a person can have. Of the ten guys that I graduated, there were only four still in ministry. So 15 years ago, I finished seminary. Out of, the, out of my class of ten, ten men, there's only four of us. Being a pastor, being a leader of a church, can be very difficult. Churches are hard, are hard on pastors. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, it says, Contribute to their joy and their leadership, not its drudgery. Why would you want to make things harder for them? We often think our pastors are invincible. Or it would seem, as, uh, or it would seem so as we will say things about our pastor that we would not dare to say about our leaders that we have in the world. We are willing to throw our pastors under the bus. We're willing to put unreal expectations on their families. And we are willing to put the, run them down physically and emotionally without a second thought. 
In the USA Today article by Greg Warner, he states this. He says, being a pastor, a high-profile, high-stress job with nearly impossible expectations for success can send one down a road to depression, according to pastoral counselors. We are set, we set the bar so high that most pastors can't achieve it, says L.B. H.B. London, Vice President of Pastoral Ministries at Focus on the Family, based in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And because most pastors are people's pleasers, they get frustrated and feel they can't live up to that. When pastors fail to live up to the demands imposed by them, by themselves or others, they often turn their frustrations back on themselves, leading to self-doubt and feelings of failure and hopelessness, said Fred Smoot, Executive Director of Emory Clergy uh, Care in Duluth, uh, Georgia, which provides pastoral care to 1,200 United Methodist ministers in Georgia. A pastor is like a 24-hour ER, who is supposed to be available to those at any, to any at, to, available to any congregant at, at any time, says Steve Scogin, president of CareNet, a network of 21 pastoral counsel centers in North Carolina. We create an environment that makes it hard to admit our humanity. And finally, in the last part of this, uh, uh, a quote from him, it says, it's a job that breeds isolation and loneliness. The pastorate, great occupational hazard, said Mr. Gosher, who's counseled many Baptists and other ministers, these suicides are born out of lack of those social supports that can intervene in times of personal crisis. This article was written in response to a pastor who had taken his own life. Now you think maybe it was a pastor of a church of maybe 20 or 30, or a pastor that was in a struggling church, but the reality, this is a pastor that was in a church of, of close to two to 300 people. A church that was looking like it was successful. Being a pastor sometimes can be one of the hardest jobs. It is, or it is one of the hardest jobs that any man or woman can be called to. And as we get ready to call a new pastor to our church, I would ask you to consider and to pray about how it is that you can make his life or her life a joy as they come to serve here at East BC. It's a challenge that all of us need to consider. Now, this couldn't be possible to be the case here in our church, but that a pastor or a leader might feel like this described here. The reality is, though, I believe it could be a possibility as it is with any church. You know, the reality is that there's times that I know that, that you might be surprised that even as your pastor, I've, I've felt times that I've been low or down or struggling. There are times that I felt like, like I was pretty much alone. But it happens. And it can be a very big struggle. And I would encourage you to think about that and to consider that as we call a new pastor to be here with you. So we can fall into the time, at times of the trap of making it more difficult. In, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, it says, You who are younger must follow your leaders, but all of you, leaders and followers alike, are to be down to earth with each other. For God hasn't has had it with the proud, but takes delight in just plain people. And I want to be plain before you this morning. As I tell you that there's times that I, I struggle too. And I'm sure there's times that you struggle as well. But we need to be honest with each other and be, be honest, uh, transparent with one, each other, with one another. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12, it tells us, And now, friends, we ask you to honor those leaders who work so hard for you. You have been given the responsibility of urging and guiding you, and, and who have been given the responsibility of urging and guiding you along in your obedience. Overwhelmed with appreciation and love. We need to care for and love each other. And it starts by beginning by being down to earth with one another. I know it sounds like I'm just taking care of my own situation and interests, and that's all I hope that's not what you beyond that this morning. The reality is, in your lifetime, you'll have other pastors that work alongside you and work with you. And I would ask that you keep this hard attitude in mind. Because it will help this church, this congregation, function as God's intended for it to function. It will create a more godly way of us being a church body. 
Seven hard attitudes. Hard attitudes that can help this congregation move towards completing the work God's called to do. If you're willing to make them a part of your life. It'll make it such a difference. Let me remind you of all seven. Number one. Put the goals and interests of others above your own. Number two. Live an honest, open life before others. That's being plain, right? That's being who we are. Number three is give, spirit, give and receive spiritual correction. So in other words, be willing to hear when, we're, when we fail. And be willing to hear when we've gone wrong. Or gone sideways, so to speak. Number four is clear up relationships. Five, participate in the ministry. Number six, we heard last week, is support the work financially. And today, number seven is follow spiritual leadership within spiritual movements and make it a joyful. Be plain and honest, right? I want you to know the last three years have been a joy for me to serve here. I have only a few more months left. I don't get a lot of chances. I'm not going to get a lot of chances to tell you. I've become very close to many of you, and you know I I love I've loved being here as your pastor. And I I know that down the years, down the road, there'll be other pastors that come, and and I'll become a faded memory. <laughs> but I want you to know it is so good to be here alongside. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's tough. And sometimes I've made you mad. And sometimes I've made you glad. Sometimes you know I'm not the easiest guy to deal with. 